Welcome back to the V2 e-section of program where we are basically talking of uh, building services and water supply and sanitation. Today we are going to look at uh, how we basically quantity or quantify the sewage and design a sewer with respect to the quantification and evaluation of a uh, calculation of the sewage that comes out of it. Before any sewer line is designed, it is necessary to know that the quantity of sewage that flows th is through a sewer. So, sewage is basically classified into two heads, one is sanitary sewage also called as the dry weather flow, it is a waste which from water which is supplied to domestic purposes, public places as, as such as institutions, cinemas, hotels, railway stations and industries. Storm water is another sewage which basically consists of all the runoff which is available from roofs, streets, yards and open spaces during the rainfalls. The quantity of sewage which happens on both these systems totally depends on the population which is quantity of sanitary sewage which directly depends on the population as the population increases the quantity also increases. The type of area whether it is a residential area, an industrial area or even a commercial area and what kind of groundwater infiltration happens. Groundwater basically percolates into the sewers only from faulty joints and cracks. So, quantity of percolation depends on the height of the water table above the sewers, the size and nature of faults and cracks in the sewer lines. The rate of water supply is assumed to be equal to the rate of sewage. So, you have to be very sure in terms of how we are actually working on the sewage quantification because depending on the number of people, depending on the type of uh, you know usage as well as the infiltration as well as how we actually the whole groundwater uh, plan has been designed is actually thought of with respect to putting forward the quantification. For properly designing uh, of uh, storm water sewers, storm water has to be ascertained correctly. So, it also depends on the following factors, one is rainfall. So, rainfall is more or larger the quantity of the storm water, two the nature of the surface over which the rainfall takes place, so the area. So, we are working, uh, talking about the harder surfaces which provide more quantity of storm water than the softer surfaces and the intensity of rainfall. The third part which is basically the amount of rainfall which falls within the real time, real unit time. It is expressed in millimeters and centimeters per hour. Next dry weather flow. With respect to the dry weather flow which is occurring in sewers in separate sewer system or a flow that occurs only in the dry seasons in a combined system, it is basically indicating the flow of sanitary sewage. The rate of water supply, the type of area which is going to be served, the economic conditions of the people, the weather conditions of that area and the infiltration of the ground water are laid below the ground water table. So, you have to be very sure in terms of how exactly the whole uh, dry flow happens there. So, quantification is totally dependent on area to be drained which is shown as A in calculated in hectares. The nature of the surface that is we are going to see as to how much of impermeability factor is there which is seen as I and intensity of the rainfall which is R. So, R is mm per R. So, quantification depends on area, impermeability and rainfall by 360 that is the number of days. So, when we work on this particular formula we get a correct estimation of at least the sewage discharge which is necessary, otherwise sewage may uh, you know prove to be inadequate with respect to overflowing or may even prove to be too large in diameter which might make the system to be uneconomical and also hydraulically insufficient or inefficient. So, any time before designing a whole sewerage system it is very important for us to know the discharge 
the quantity of the sewage which will flow into it and after completion of the project and at the end of the design project. So, if you know the whole process of it right from the point A to point B to point C and point D, then we know as to how exactly we can quantify and evaluate the discharge of the sewage. Apart from the water which is accounted there, which is supplied by the water authority, there is another waste water which comes which has to be converted to actually quantify it and then look into estimation there also. So, what are the ways in which we are again looking into the um, you know uh, waste water which is to be converted. One is addition which is happening due to unaccounted private water supplies. Here people which who are using the water supply from private wells, tube wells contribute also to the waste water generation more than the waste water that is supplied by the municipal authority. So, <coughs> similarly many industries also have their own source of water. Part of this water after the desired use is converted into waste water and ultimately discharged into the sewer. So, this quantity also has to be uh, you know observed and estimated by actual field observations. Next addition that happens due to infiltration. This is an additional quantity due to the ground water seepage which happens in the sewers through faulty joints or cracks which are formed in the pipes. The quantity of the water depends upon the height of the water table above the sewer invert level. If water table is well below the sewer invert level, the infiltration can occur only after the rain when the rain water is moving down the soil. The quantity of the water which enters through the sewers totally depends upon the permeability of the ground soil and it is very difficult to estimate this. So, while estimating the design discharge, the following suggested discharge can be considered because it is convenient to actually only read out this. The table estimates the minimum and the maximum ground water infiltration for sewers which are laid for ground water table below a particular uh, level. So, storm water drainage which may also infiltrate into the services and this flow is difficult to calculate. Generally, no extra provision is made for this quantity. This extra quantity can be taken care of by extra uh, by adding an extra empty space at the top in the sewers, which is designed by running at least three fourth at maximum design discharge. So, this means that any sewer is basically designed for three fourth full of maximum discharge, but then when this kind of an addition that happens due to infiltration also gets added up onto your sewer lines. It should work not with a much larger quantity or the um, section of the sewer, but for the same empty space that is left at the top of the sewers. Subtraction due to water losses. The water loss through leakage in water distribution system and house connections does not reach all the consumers and hence does not appear as sewage. Subtraction due to water not entering into the sewerage system. Certain amount of water is used for purposes which might not generate sewage like boiler feed water, the water which is sprinkled on the roads, streets, lawns and gardens, water which is consumed by industrial products, water used in air coolers and all this is also some of the water which is not entering into the sewerage system. So, the net quantity of sewage should also be kept you know in mind with respect to its calculation. So, how do we calculate net quantity of sewage? One is accounted quantity which the municipal corporation will give you of all the water which is supplied from the water works. Addition due to unaccounted private water supplies as mentioned earlier, addition due to infiltration subtraction is minus there okay, due to water losses and subtraction due to water which is not entering into the sewerage system. So, water loss and the water which is not entering into the sewerage system are subtracted. So, generally at least 75 to 80 percent of the accounted water supply is considered as quantity of sewage which is produced. This is clear right. So, with this we also have an impermeability factor. Impermeability factor happens in terms of you know the absorption of water in uh, because of all the surface uh, runoffs. One is because of watertight roofs, 
the probability would be at least till 0.95. If there are concrete roads, pavements with tighter joints or open joints would also have in the same average. Residential areas with detached houses would have 0.25 to 0.50, open spaces would have 0.10 to 0.30, gardens, lawns and parks would have 0.05 to 0.25 and farmland and forest would have 0.01 to 0.20. In sewage flow, variation basically occurs over an annual average daily flow. The fluctuation in the flow occurs hour to hour from season to season. The typical hourly variation in the sewage flow is shown in the figure here. If the flow is gauche near its origin, all right, the peak flow will be quite pronounced. The peak will differ if the sewage has to travel a longer distance. This is because of the time required in collecting sufficient quantity of sewage which is required to fill the sewers and time also which is required to travel. As the sewage flow in sewer lines becomes you know increases in transportation more and more sewage is mixed in it due to continuous increase in the area being served by the sewer line. This leads to reduction in the fluctuations in the sewage flow and the lag period keeps on increases. So, a typical hourly variation in the sewage flow from 8 am to 9 pm shows that if this is the water demand and that is the sewage flow, the water demand would be high and the sewage flow would be lower in the early morning hours. The water demand reduces and the sewage flow increases during the midday and the end of the day the water demand suddenly increases and then the water uh, risk also increases and the sewage also starts accumulating the pressure at that moment. So, for estimating the variation in the flow, we need to see the design discharge following the relation that should be considered in terms of maximum daily flow. Two times the, uh, the annual day, uh, daily flow represents a seasonal variation, whereas in an hourly flow at least 1.5 times the maximum day flow is to be considered with respect to every hour's fluctuation and 3 times the annual average daily flow. The minimum flow which passes through the sewers is very important to develop some kind of a self cleansing velocity to avoid silting in the sewers. The flow generates during late night hours when the water is lower in content and the flow is also low. So, this effect of flow is more pronounced and the, in the lateral sewers than the main sewers because main sewers continuously has the flow of water whereas lateral sewers would not have the water in the sleeping hours. So, sewers must be checked for minimum velocity with respect to a minimum daily flow should be at least two third the annual average daily flow and an hourly flow is should be at least half the daily flow. The overall variation between the maximum and minimum flow should be more in laterals and less in the main or trunk sewers. This ratio should be more than 6 for laterals and about 2 to 3 in case of main sewers. So, this is the main sewer basically the trunk sewer. So, the collection of water here could be more when compared to the lateral sewers. So, what are the factors which are considered in selecting a material for the sewers? One is the availability of the required sizes, two the cost of the material, so the affordability, third is durability, fourth ease of handling as well as installation, fifth strength to resist any kind of structural failure because we have to travel long distances here, sixth resistance to chemical attacks all along the journey, seventh ease of jointing as well as the water tightness, eighth effect of friction in relation to its coefficient of flow and the last is the resistance to score. The scoring velocity should be resistantly higher. So, the various materials that are available in the market are asbestos, right. Then we also have brick sewers, we have cement sewers, we have plastic sewers, we have stone sewers, steel sewers and even cast iron sewers. So, totally depending on what exactly is feasible for us on our site, we can use them based on our advantages and disadvantages which will be shown to you here. For an asbestos cement pipeline, 
They are, these are basically manufactured with a mixture of asbestos fibers, silica and cement. They are commonly used for most of the house drainage. These pipes are used for vertical transport of water. For example, transport of rainwater from the roofs in multi-storied buildings, for transport of sewage to grounds and for transport of less foul sellage that is wastewater from the kitchen and bathroom. The advantages of uh, an asbestos pipeline are they are light in weight, hence very easy to carry and transport. They are easy to cut and assemble without any kind of skill labor needed. Interior is smooth that can make an excellent hydraulically efficient sewer. The disadvantages are these pipes are not structurally strong. They are susceptible to corrosion by sulfuric acid. When bacteria produces H2S in the presence of water, H2SO4 is formed. A plain cement concrete pipe or reinforced cement concrete pipe. These pipes for smaller sizes are available at least 2.45 meters in diameter and reinforcement cement pipes are available up to 1.8 meters in diameter. They should not be used to carry any kind of acidic effluents or sewage. They should be used for only surface draining in all kinds of diameter. Advantages of concrete pipes are they are stronger in tension as well as compression. They are resistant to erosion and abrasion. They can be made of any desired strength. They can be easily molded and can be made on site or precast pipes. They are economically uh, fit for medium and large sizes and they are available in wide range of sizes. Disadvantages are these pipes get corroded and pitted with the action of H2SO4. The carrying capacity of pipe reduces with time because of the corrosion. The pipes are susceptible to erosion by sewage which contains silt as well as grit. Clay or stoneware sewers, these pipes are mostly favored for house connections or residential connections as well as for lateral sewers. The size of these pipes are available with respect to 5 centimeter to 30 centimeter. So, there is a wide range that is available and internal diameters from a length of 0.9 to 1.2 meters. The advantages of this is this, uh, these are resistant to corrosion, hence fit for carrying polluted water such as sewage. The interior surface is smooth and hydraulically efficient. These pipes are highly impervious. So, the pipe material does not absorb any kind of water, more than 5 percent of the um, weight. So, when immersed in water for 24 hours, they are stronger in compression, they are durable and economical for smaller diameters. The disadvantages are they are heavy, bulkier and brittle, so very difficult for transportation. Brick sewers, this is used for construction of large size combined sewer or particularly storm water drains. These pipes are plastered from outside to avoid entry of tree roots as well as groundwater through brick joints. These are lined from inside with stoneware or ceramic blocks to make them smooth and hydraulically efficient. The lining is also made so that the pipes do not resist with respect to corrosion. Nowadays, we do not see these kind of pipelines because they are replaced by concrete sewers. Cast iron sewers are used as to withstand a lot of uh, high internal pressures and external loads, but they are very expensive. So, they are used only for outfall sewers, rising mains of pumping stations and inverted siphons, whereas pipes are running under high pressure. The light cast iron pipes are used only for house drainages. They are also suitable for sewers under high traffic loads such as sewers below railways as well as highways. They form 100 percent leak proof sewer line to avoid any kind of mishaps or accidents. Steel pipes, these are used under the situation such as high pressure sewers, underwater crossings, bridge crossings, necessary connections for pumping stations as well as to lay pipes over self supporting spans. Steel pipes can withstand a lot of internal pressure, they are more ductile and can withstand water, hammer, pressure better. They are susceptible to corrosion, they cannot withstand high external load and they are protected internally and externally against the action of corrosion. Plastic sewers, 
are a recent material which have come into the market and used for sewer pipes. They are used for internal drainage works at homes. They are also available in various sizes right from 75 mm to 315 mm of an external diameter that is drainage work uh, uh, is very convenient to work with these pipelines. They offer a smooth internal surface and the additional um, advantages of this kind of a pipeline is they are resistant to corrosion, they are lightweight, they are economical with respect to maintenance, jointing as well as laying. This pipe is tough and rigid and also eases in terms of fabrication and transportation of these pipes. The next thing that we have to also keep in mind are the shape of sewers. As we all know most of the sewers are either circular or non-circular. For circular pipelines we also we either have them as big sewers or concrete sewers. So, these are the concrete sewers which are again considered as the bedding sewers, the haunched sewer which is haunched inside and then an encased sewer which would be inside like a trunk sewer and all. Or if we actually consider them in comparison to a non-circular uh, uh, sewer, a circular sewer is basically preferred because there is le lesser material for the same area. There are no corners, so chances of deposition are very low. It is easy to construct as well as handle and not suitable when the flow keeps varying. Disadvantages are they are not effective in terms of combined sewerage system and it is negligible compared to the combined flow during the rains. There are a lot of other shapes which are non-circular. We have a standard egg shaped sewer, a new egg shaped sewer, a horseshoe shaped sewer, a parabolic sewer, a rectangular sewer, a U shaped sewer, a semicircular shaped sewer and a basket handle sewer. So, all of these sewers are also alternative to circular sewers. So, this is a standard egg shaped sewer along with a new or modified egg shaped sewer where we basically see that there are two different pipelines, one is a smaller pipeline and then a larger pipeline. So, because if you have to house both the pipelines together then a egg shaped sewer is considered. A horseshoe sewer is basically shaped like a horseshoe and a parabolic section would also have a parabola section there. A rectangular sewer is another alternative along with a basket handle and a semicircular section. The drains, the kind of surface drains that we see are in terms of sludge water as well as storm water because both of them do not have foul water, um, foul matter. So, it is very easy for us to allow this kind of a drainage to be flowing in an open. There are four different shapes of surface drains. One is a rectangular section which is suited for heavy discharges, not suitable for smaller discharges as they do not develop the kind of self cleansing velocity here and it is very difficult to clean because of the edges. A semicircular drain, it is adopted for smaller size drains and not suitable for larger uh, uh, surface drains. A V shaped drain is a self cleansing velocity. Here even for smaller discharges it cleanses itself and it is also very easy for us to clean it manually. A U shaped drain combines the advantages of both semicircular as well as rectangular drains and gives us that edge because of which we have this self cleansing velocity. How do we think of design of sewers? Sewers are designed in the same process in which we lay out our water pipelines or conveyances of pipelines. So, th there would be a water main. So, right parallel to it would be a storm water or a sewer line which basically moves perpendicular to both storm water as well as water main. So, we basically design it in an alternative manner. So, there, there is no clash of flow of water there. A certain minimum velocity has to be maintained that is one major consideration for us to avoid any kind of silting as well as choking of sewers. Such a minimum velocity is called as self cleansing velocity. A silting or deposition of particles is undesirable. So, we have to keep this in mind when we are trying to talk about self cleansing velocity. 
Servers should also be laid at a gradient to attain a minimum velocity and to attain this self cleansing velocity at least once preferably twice in a day. So, if the velocity is very high particles will start damaging the smooth surface of the sewer. So, that is when scouring starts happening. So, maximum permissible velocity at which no scouring action takes place is known as non scouring velocity and it depends on the material of the sewer. So, for various materials we have a various cleansing velocity or non scouring velocity based on which we can pick up as to based on our flow we can pick up the kind of sewer that is needed for us. The other factors which are to be considered are velocity as I have been mentioning sewers should always be laid at a gradient which produces a sufficient high velocity to remove all the solids and does not permit any kind of settlement. So, in India we generally take it as 1 to 1.2 meter per second and the maximum velocity is limited to 3.35. The gradient of the sewer is given with respect to the direction of the natural slope of the ground depending on the minimum and maximum velocity which is not steeper than 1 is to 20. For a residential connection we give a 1 is to 40 or a 1 is to 80 and for sludge we give a minimum 1 in 100. The diameter should not less be lesser than 15 centimeter and should not be more than 3 meters in terms of internal diameter. Small sewers require greater care and discharging from a larger sewer to a smaller sewer should be avoided. The design layout of a severage system is also something that is to be given a lot of consideration. First thing that we have to see before we enter into the designing of a severage system is what are the main contents that are needed to design a severage system. One main map of the area right. Next the contour plan of the area. So, we understand the topography of the area to understand gradients of the area. Then the profile of the longitudinal sections of all the streams in and around the area, elevations of the streams and the buildings, the electric cables, the waterways and telephone cables, the type of pavements of the streets as well as lanes, location of public utilities, road intersections, location of basements of multi-storied buildings and population and its distribution. When we try to see all of this then comes the method of design. While designing first thing that we have to see is we have to mark the sewer line showing at to which the direction of flow is uh, to be ascertained. Once we understand the flow wide streets having two sets of sewers must be picked up. One is the main and then the sub main both are kept at low levels. Pumping of the sewage is to be avoided as far as possible. Marking and numbering of all the manholes should be done right from uh, out all outfall upwards. Severage system should be designed at least for 50 years and above. The quantity of the sewage should be approximately 70 to 80 percent of the water that is supplied. So, when we are cal calculating all the sewages, we have to keep in mind about the appurtenances that are needed for the sewage. Right from the laterals to the sidewalks, how we actually clean out the venting and then the clean outs at different levels. Additional structures or components are required to make the construction cost easy and efficient working of a main, uh, sewer maintenance, which needs proper silting, you know proper ashes, uh, grit, oil, fats and all should be removed with respect to the sewer lines otherwise choking might happen. So, we have to keep in mind about all these sewer appurtenances which are needed. The catch basins are the first appurtenances, clean outs, lamp holes, drop man holes, the flushing tanks, grease and oil traps, inlets, manholes, storm water regulators ventilation of sewers, inverted siphons and inspection chambers. Now, we are going to look into each of them briefly. A lamp hole is an opening constructed for the purpose of lowering a lamp inside a um, you know sewer line. So, what do you have in this kind of a lamp hole? Basically, it is a flushing device. Uh, also, it is used as a fresh air inlet. Location is basically 
in terms of whenever we have a change of uh, root, a change of gradient or some kind of a curve in the uh, flow of direction, then that is where we provide a lamp hole. We also provide it if the space is insufficient and if the construction of a manhole is difficult there. So, a sewer length is straight con and considered with respect to the spacing of the manholes. Second are inlets. These are where all the storm waters actually enter into our sewers. They are placed by the sides of the roads at 30 to 60 meter intervals. There are two different types of inlets. One is vertical or curb inlet, second is a horizontal inlet. So, that is a vertical inlet. So, you have a concrete box and from there all the water actually enters into the storm water sewer or it directly flows from the road grates into the concrete box and flows into the uh, water sewer. So, we have a horizontal inlet and a vertical inlet totally depending on how we are letting the water enter into our gradient. Next we have catch basins. The catch basins are basically chambers which are provided along the sewer lines to admit the clear rain water free from silt and debris. Catch basins prevent the entry of silt, grit and debris. They also prevent escape of sewer gas. So, if this is the curb with openings, so all the rain water basically enters here, then we also have a catch basin. So, this is covered with perforations from where we have a, a, um, a concrete uh, storage space where all the water goes collects itself there, all the impurities will be at the lower level and there would be a sewer line which is connected like a hood and from where all the water actually exits from there. So, in these catch basins we also have traps, some are called as grease traps and the others are called as oil traps. So, these traps are used to exclude all the grease and oil which comes from the sewage lines. They are located basically near to kitchens, industries, workshops, garages and any place which would emit or exit grease and oil. If they are not removed, they stick to the surface of the sewer and might cause obstruction of the flow. So, inlets are provided at the top and outlets are provided near the bottom where the oil free water is drained out. So, basically what happens here is you have these inlets with grating. So, all the water enters here. You have sand there which goes and collects itself there and after which the water starts rising. When the water rises above this particular wall which is laid uh, and constructed, this water goes into the outlet. Otherwise, the grease and oil collects itself as the surface at, at the surface at the topmost layer here and the sand gets collected here. So, only the water or the liquid waste leaves the oil traps. This chamber is divided into two parts. So, we would have something called as a baffle walls. So, these baffle walls are uh, provided in between the chamber where the inlet acts as a silt trap. So, all these uh, silts will be um, trapped there and then the outlet will act as a grease and oil trap. So, all the grease and oil actually gets trapped there and only the liquids can move into their journey. Then we have clean outs. Clean outs are basically removable covers which are inclined pipes. They are connected to the underground sewage. The other end is at the ground level and it is covered. So, this water is forced through clean out pipes to remove any obstacles in the sewer line. So, if this is the sewer line and you have a flow of your drains, there will be a clean out which is at an inclined 45 degree. So, you have a removable cover, you remove the cover and you clean it up because this ends at the ground level or at the edge of the pipe. So, you can easily clean it up and once uh, because this is at the ground level. So, this is where a human or a particular machine sits and cleans it up and then the flow continues if, if there is any choking there or any obstruction. Manholes. Manholes are uh, constructed to connect the ground level with the hole or opening which are made in the sewer lines. So, a person can actually enter into it and carry out any kind of maintenance. If the person enters into the uh, manholes, he can inspect 
he can clean and he can also do any kind of maintenance works there. Also change the direction or joining of sewers from there. So, it is located at every bend or at every angle junction and the gradient change or even at a diameter change. So, you have to be very sure as to where you are working out on your manholes uh, location because manholes are basically provided whenever there is a change in direction of the liquids. So, this is a main sewer and it is benching here when the benches so from the branch sewer all the water comes in it benches here and then enters into the main sewer. So, from there it all these main sewers would connect themselves there and those are branch sewers which are benched you see the benched mark there right. So, this two get connected there and that is the working chamber. So, a person who comes accesses the manhole from the steps which are provided here comes here cleans or maintains or even changes the direction and then actually leaves the space after the work is done. There is another uh, appurtenances which is called as a drop manhole. This is also very similar to a manhole, but it connects to the higher level branch sewers to the lower level main sewers. It avoids unnecessary gradients in the uh, when it is steep. A drop connection is provided where a manhole which is built at a vertical or near a vertical drop pipe from the higher sewer to the lower sewer. So, basically for apartment buildings for any building where you have pipelines coming vertically all the way from uh, space to the lowest space this is provided outside the shaft and encast in concrete or supported on brackets inside the shafts. Flushing tanks, these are devices or arrangements which are made to hold or throw the water into the sewer for the purpose of cleaning. So, whenever we need to clean it, what basically happens is we will have these flushing tanks from where water discharges comes in when we can clean up the whole surface and then close down the tap again and then from there the flow pipe would let it uh, let the water flow into the sewer. Basically. Uh, the flushing is conveniently accomplished with the usage of a fire hydrant also or even a tanker and hose. There are two different types here, one is a hand operated flushing tank where you can operate it uh, by hand, discharge the amount of water needed and then you can close it again when the water is not uh, needed or automatic flushing tanks. Here it does at a time interval which is stipulated and adjusted there. So, at every time interval it keeps flushing the tank. The purpose is to self cleanse the velocity due to the flatness of the gradient and especially when there are branch sewers which are meeting the main sewers you would need this to actually quantify the water which is not treated, but is going to be treated. There are also regulators called as storm water regulators. These are structures which divert the sewage from combined or partially separated sewers. The purpose of these regulators are they divert the excess water to natural streams and they decrease the load on the treatment units on the pumping station. There are three different types of storm water regulators, a leaping wire, a overflowing wire and a siphon spillway. So, that is a leaping wire. You have a storm and a sanitary flow, both of them come together during a dry weather here and that is the sanitary saw. So, this next the storm water goes out there because of this wall. So, this is called as a leaping wire because you have to leap and then go in case of a wet weather. An overflow wire is basically when the storm and sanitary are together okay, and before they enter into the treatment plant they basically moving through the sectional elevation of the whole um, spillway. This is a siphon spillway. <coughs> a siphonic tank is provided, a primary pipe is provided with the throat, then the combined sewer comes in touch with the uh, tank. When the whole tank gets filled and it is supposed to overflow, that is when this spillway comes in contact with the sewer. This inspection chamber, the water seal of about 100 mm is provided in the last manhole of the house. It conveys the sewage from house to house 
uh, to the public system. So, this is where the public and the private system gets separated. This trap is used to prevent the entry of sewer gases from the public sewer lines to the house drainages. The ventilators in sewers, there are various gases in the um, sewers due to decomposition of all the organic materials which might cause harm to human health and corrode the sewers reducing their life. So, we provide these ventilators because these sewers might be highly expense, uh, explosive. So, ventilation is provided at every 80 to 100 meters to a height of at least um, 4 to 5 floors. So, the ventilation is also uh, continuously happening. The last uh, appurtenance is the inverted siphon. This is a sewer section when constructed lower than the adjacent sewer sections and it runs under the gravity because the pressure is more than the atmospheric pressure there. And the more appropriate to refer it to uh, instead of calling it as an inverted siphon, we can also call it as a di depressed sewer or a sac pipe because it is actually depressing after the manhole. So, the purpose is to carry any kind of a sewer line below obstructions such as roads, highways, depressions, streams, rivers or even railways. The velocity is since it is self cleansing at least 1 mps for minimum flow and thus does not allow any kind of deposition in the line. Inlet and outlet chambers, those are inlet and outlet chambers. So, they are allowing an enough entry and maintenance for the siphons. The outlet chamber is designed so as to prevent any kind of backflow of the sewage into the pipes which are not used at the time of max minimum flows. So, with this uh, we end all the appurtenances in the sewage treatment and uh, uh, the design and uh, as to how exactly the whole sewage treatment plant uh, works right from laying, uh, right from its introduction to the exit of the sewer. Thank you so much.